and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome to this very special episode of Irreverent Faith and Current Affairs. I am genuinely extremely excited about this one uh, because I am joined by two eminent thinkers, uh, Professor Barry Smith and Dr. Jan Jobst Langrieb, MD, who are the authors of this wonderful book, which is called Why Machines Will Never Rule the World, Artificial Intelligence Without Fear. I've been grappling with this with this book over recent days, and I think it's I think it's highly relevant to many of the themes that we discuss on irreverence, particularly things to do with transhumanism, artificial inter- intelligence, how a global government might utilize technology in order to take over the world, and all these kind of very very interesting and important themes. And I don't mean that flippantly at all. And uh, we are we are graced with two eminent thinkers, as I say here, and I think their their accomplishments and interests are so legion that it be it'd be easiest just to simply let you chaps uh, introduce yourselves. So, um, Jobst, coming coming to you first, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and, and your background and, and your involvement in this book? Good. Thank you, Jamie, for inviting us. I feel really honoured. So, um, because for the benefit of this special audience here, so I am um, a son of two theologians. My parents are both Prot- Lutheran theologians. My mother comes from one of the oldest um, and most productive uh, family of Lutheran theologians. So the Hochstädters have really produced hundreds of, of, of reverends. And um, and uh, I, I'm by, by training, I'm a um, physician, biochemist and mathematician. So I did a PhD in cell biology and then later I studied mathematics and became a biomathematician. I met um, my co-author Barry Smith um, due to my work in medical ontology. And um, I uh, have worked in artificial intelligence theory and practice since over 20 years, since 1998. And so um, a couple of years ago, um, I saw the necessity to write this book. Yes, yes. Excellent, excellent. And uh, and Barry, um, a little bit about yourself and, and your background. Good. So first of all, I was born in England, studied in Oxford and Manchester as a philosopher. I uh, I wrote a PhD on German and Austrian philosophy, uh, but uh, I gradually realized that there were uh, ways in which the philosophical interests that I developed could be useful in the wider world. And so I started applying some of these ideas in medicine and in biology, and that's where I came into contact with the OBST. And uh, for the last 20 years or so, I've been working with all kinds of uh, non-philosophical researchers in the military, in uh, industry, and still in biology and medicine uh, to show how philosophy can be helpful to their work. Mm -hmm. And um, the the latest uh, exploration along these lines is in the area of uh, artificial intelligence, which is what we'll be talking about now. Yeah, Excellent. I should say, however, that I will try to stay in the background. So, uh, unless I feel a strong urge, you should just expect me to be smiling. Uh, Excellent. Unless you feel wisely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Unless you feel compelled to make an intervention. So, um, okay. So, I think we should start. I mean, you obviously just mentioned um, sort of a need for this book. Um, in the book itself, you you mentioned. I, I think this book is a really it's a really good book because it's obviously written at a high. level it's an academic book but you often refer to some of the stuff that's going on in in popular culture you know um quoting from you know elon elon musk talking about you know the way that you know machines will will soon be ruling over us and and they'll be our overlords and they will have these capacities and propensities and so on and so forth so there's obviously something in the culture that is um proposing proposing these ideas we're obviously familiar with with the ideas of machines taking taking over from from science fiction um you know films like the matrix or the terminator you know these are the things that were kind of coming to my mind when i was when i was reading through this book um so there's obviously something in the culture as well and i get i i pick this up not because i know because it's not really my academic area but it seems to me reading the book that in the academic world, there's also this sort of stream of thought, which is almost expecting science to develop in this direction. 
Jobs, is, is that the way you see it? And could you articulate a bit more about the need for this for this book? Yes. So I think that um, we are living in a in a cultural age of of um, uh, massive loss of faith in our society, which has been observable over the last two hundred years. And as as you know, um, thinkers of the nineteenth century um, like Stirner and Nietzsche already, already recognized, but also Auguste Comte, there would be a new secular religion. Yeah would arise and transhumanism and the belief in artificial intelligence are part of the positivist tradition of secular uh, pseudo religion so basically we have now a pseudo religion that is has replaced for many of of our contemporaries um a christian faith and a part of it is in the belief of an infinite process progress of technology and a, a view of technology like uh, you know an eschatological entity mm. Um, uh, and I think that that this uh, is what we are also observing in the, in the era of um, of artificial intelligence and transhumanism, um, a, a belief that basically um, uh, we can be our own gods, as Stirner and Nietzsche formulated it, using technology. Yeah. And um, the book uh, refutes this claim, but not using theological arguments, but purely arguments from science. Yes. Yes, yes, that's, and that's very interesting. And it's again, it's not it's not really my area, but I'm aware that in sort of um, you know, sort of modern Protestant liberal theology, sometimes the suggestion is made that um, the eschaton or you know the resurrection, the general resurrection at the end of the time, will be a sort of something which is brought about by human technology itself um, in the form of transhumanism. Yeah, I mean, this is of course such a, such an idea is of course a perversion of of our Christian religion. Nowhere in the Scripture can you find anything about this, right? Yeah. There is what Bultmann called presentic presentic eschatology in John, yeah. which means that you can encounter God in the present in another human being, but that has nothing to do with us, you know, uh, calling in the uh, the last days or the, the judgment day, right? It's yeah. that's uh, nonsense. So. So, but basically, that's the the, the cultural um, background against which we have to understand claims by people like Musk or or others um, that, that we mentioned, like Martin Rothblatt, who believe in transhumanism and believe that machines uh, will will um, become more intelligent than humans, which they call the singularity. Yes, yes, and I think uh, it'd be really interesting to to talk about the main argument of the book. But let's just talk about let's just push that a little bit further. So, is it? Is, would you say that it's in the absence of the Christian eschatology that people feel the need to posit some kind of hope for eternal life, whether it's for the individual or for the species? You know, um, in, in again, in popular culture, ideas of um, you know cryogenic freezing and things like like this is is uh, I've, i also we we covered on the show oh a long time ago now nine months or so maybe a year it was a year ago but. Um, uh, Jeff Bezos investing in 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 research uh, to do with a similar kind of technology, I think, something to do with you know cryogenic freezing or or something like that to preserve part of his body so he could live forever and blah blah blah. Is that is that the way you see it? Is is it is it people attempting to replace the hope of Christian eschatology with with something that's brought about by technology? Yeah. So Schleiermacher described in the beginning of the nineteenth century the religious need. Mm. So, which he thought, saw as an, um, we would say today, existential constant. Mm. So a basic property of human beings that they have a religious need. I believe that this is true. There are people who can um, live without faith and without religion. But for most people, there's a, he was right that they have this strong need. And uh, when you lose um, the traditional faith, like Christianity or in other parts of the world, other religions, um, the religious need, which Schleiermacher describes, does not go away. Mm. And so that's why then you are overcome by this need and need to find new ways of materializing it. And so the, the this this idea of immortality, whether it is to be brought about um, basically biochemically or digitally, which is also a big idea in these circles, uh, is is uh, of this kind of of, of pseudo faith that replaces the true religion, mm. and um, uh, we have uh, Barry Smith and I have also written um, a, a paper about it called Digital Immortality, which was unfortunately for this purpose uh, published in German, <laughs> uh, but we we wrote. We wrote also about it in the book. There's a chapter which contains some of the arguments that we uh, bring forward in this paper. 
Yes, yes, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, well, this is it's it's so interesting to me because this is a theme which I think is is a I think this is really a salient theme in the in the podcast that we we come up against over and over again. This idea that there is a sort of pseudo religious um, sensibility which is at play. I mean, it's it's incoherent in many ways, but but it's still a, it's still at play in all of these kind of social issues that we talk about. Um, you know, whether whether it be the the COVID situation, or whether it be climate change, or whether it be um, uh, something to do with transhumanism and artificial intelligence, there is a, there is a there is a sense in which it's it's it goes beyond rationality, if I can put it like that. I don't want to say it's completely irrational, but it's certainly sort of there's a non-rational element to it, whereby people are invested with a sort of spiritual fervor, let's say, around it. And there are categories which are recognizably religious, like um, orthodoxy and heresy. And when and when and when you stray when you stray from from orthodoxy to heresy, the the issue is not so much um, you know whether what you're saying is is um is rationally coherent or whether there's an empirical there's empirical evidence for it the 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 salient issue is that you have transgressed some kind of boundary which we we've we've all agreed somehow is 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 um is unacceptable um so i think i think that's 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 definitely something that um we explore in the podcast and i think we should talk about that uh, in the course of this conversation but first we should talk about your main argument because as you say your main argument is not uh, a theological argument and it's it's not based on any kind of um premises other than purely empirical and logical premises so um if i i'll i'll tell you what i think your argument is shall i and <laughs> you can yeah. you can you can you can um you can correct me but my so my my understanding is that what you're saying in this book is that um what you what you call an artificial general intelligence is logically impossible and an artificial general intelligence is artificial intelligence intelligence which is equal to or above human intelligence and i think part of that and you you have to you have to help me out here but but part of the agi the artificial general intelligence is that um at some point it will it will reach a, a singularity or so, at some point a singularity will occur at which machines can what replicate themselves and create machines which are more intelligent than the ones that created them and thereby kind of set off a, a chain of events whereby machines will sort of exponentially increase in intelligence and essentially take over the world i mean that that's that's more or less what you mean by the agi and the, the singularity is that right yeah, that's what the proponents of the singularity, like Ray Kurzweil. Yeah, um, I, I'm certain that he is not pronounced like this, but you know whom I mean, the Google man. Yeah. Um, uh, that they, they, that's what they call the singularity. We, of course, think that's utter nonsense. Yeah. But that's what they think the singularity is, and you've also defined AGI correctly. Yes. Yes. Um, and then I suppose the next step of that, which is presumably you think is even more fanciful, is that these machines would then have some kind of um totalitarian or malicious desire to kind of subjugate human beings and and to create you know a matrix like scenario or whatever it is whatever it is you know in the matrix it's that they want um you know they want the 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 energy from human bodies isn't it that's why they put them in these pods and so on and so forth um but you, you say this is impossible because in order to do that you would need to imitate a human neurocognitive system which is a complex system and that means that that means that it's impossible to to um to model and therefore you can't you can't create um a, a, an ai which is equal to uh human intelligence or, or can imitate human intelligence uh, I, that's that's broadly speaking what i got from the main argument so it relies on that notion that um you would need a model of a human neurocognitive system in order to create an ai mm. which is equal to a human is that you right need- you need a model that can uh, emulate um, the the neurocognitive capabilities of the human mind body continuum, right? So, so you don't need to build the same thing or something that is very similar, but you just need to be able. You would you would need to be able to create the same input output patterns. Yeah. Inside, it could look very different, of course, than the human brain, but basically, it would need to be able to perform the same behavior given a certain input. Yeah. Um, uh, to to describe it in a behavioristic uh, uh, way, and this this means that you need an emulation of uh, the human mind, 
uh, or the human mind body continuum as we stress in the book and to do this you need um you need to be have a model of how to do this and because we we are mainly arguing against the feasibility of uh, machine-based ai though we also argue in chapter 12 against other forms for a machine-based ai you need uh, to engineer something and for this you need a mathematical model so every engineered entity contains to some extent a mathematical model there's also aspects of engineering which have to do with trying things out and doing trial and error but the core is always a mathematical understanding of the world most using physics or other other applications of mathematics and um so so if you can't have such a model the mathematic mathematical model then you can't uh, uh, engineer uh, intelligence and yes. our main argument is that that because the human mind body continuum is a complex system we can't have a mathematical model of it that is good enough to um, to uh, to ena enable such an emulation or simulation. Okay, and can you can you talk to me about what you mean when you say a complex system? Because yes. many people, including myself, who don't really properly understand what that means. So, um, so almost all natural systems are complex. Only very few can be modeled as being simple or logic systems. So let's start with the logic system. So the solar system as a gravitational system. So that with the sun in the middle and um, the planets moving around the sun, uh, uh, driven by um, by their momentum and the, and the um, gravitational field uh, that the sun creates. Um, this this model, which was discovered by by Kepler and Copernicus and Galilei, and then formalized fully by Newton, um, this is a, this is a simple system because you can use simple um, uh, linear differential equations to to really predict its behavior almost perfectly. Hmm. So we can really calculate exactly what's going on in the system. So that's that's a logic system, mm -hmm. and um, these systems are are great for us because um, the mathematics. So capabilities of the human mind can be applied to them to explain them, to describe them, to create predictions about them, and also to engineer new logic systems like the steam engine or the computer or the technology, the internet technology we are now using to talk to each other. Hmm. Now, this, these are the logic systems. There are very few of them in nature. If you look closely, all natural systems are complex. And the, the the real logic systems we have are all those which we have built ourselves. Now, what what are the characteristics of a complex system? I won't go through all the characteristics. I just mentioned the three most important ones. The first one is that complex systems are, have evolutionary properties, which means that they can change any time. So they can they can develop new elements. The elements can interact in a new way and. You can see this by looking at human beings, how language evolves. Mm. Language is a typical um, complex system phenomenon because all the time new words get invented, new usages of the world, new noun phrases and verb phrases occur. And so human language is a very good example for an evolutionary system. Um, uh, the second um, uh, property I would like to mention is um, uh, the non-ergodicity of complex systems. This means that um, mathematically speaking, um, the coordinate system in which the events happen that 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 these systems uh, um, that 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 occur in these systems, so that this this coordinate space um, uh, has no regularity. So you never find um, the the if you if you imagine what's going on in a complex system at as as small points in the coordinate systems, the pattern of the of the of the points or the dots will always look different and will always be unpredictable. There's never an even distribution or repeated distribution of the dots in the coordinate system. And furthermore, the coordinates of the coordinate system can change. Mm -hmm. And so, so therefore, if you t take um, the pattern from this coordinate system or a series, a time series, the, and then you think you can, you know, create a system that, that uh, emulates this pattern, the next time you're confronted with reality, the pattern will be different because of the non-ergodic character of the system. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that very few people understand. It's quite hard to understand, but it means that no matter what you do, you can never create an AI system because of the non-ergodicity, because there is no repeating pattern. So to give you a very simple example, each wave that comes to the shore of England, since England exists and since there are waves on its shore is unique. So no, never any wave is exactly like the other. At the, at the molecular level, they are all different. Mm. So if you keep on, you know, uh, making movies of these waves, you will never create an emulation of the waves that's like the natural phenomenon. Mm. 
mm. because they are non-ergodic. And that's just a simple, uh, I mean, it's a complex system, but a relatively simple one. And and so and so this is the same for higher complex systems as well. Yes. And the third property, and then I'm done with the academic part. <laughs> no, no, it's great, it's great. The, thir the third one is that out of seven uh, that I want to mention is drivenness. So drivenness means that in a complex system, always energy is flowing through the system. And so that means, and and so um, that means that the energy has to, because of the conservation of energy, the energy that's flowing through the system is transforming itself into different forms of energy, which creates what is called in physics dissipation. So, for example, when you when I pour water into this glass, right, then I have mechanical energy, and then I get you know turbulence in the glass, and so the turbulence in the glass is a form of is a is a transformation. In, in, in the end transforms the mechanical energy into heat. Hmm. And so this is called dissipation and this is process is chaotic and cannot be modeled. So even, you know, turbulence in a glass of water, or if you have a wind in the snow and you see the snow is swirling like this, or you smoke a cigar and you see the smoke rising up from the cigar, all these are turbulence phenomena, which we can't model mathematically. Hmm. And they are only very simple uh, as, as, as phenomena of drivenness. If you compare this to the drivenness of animals, or of humans. So basically, because of this drivenness, which is characteristic of all living systems, living systems, and also many non-living systems, like the weather system, the climate system, yeah. they are driven systems. And that's why we have no mathematical tools for predicting, predicting yes. them. So that's, and also, go on. that's also why all the climate models we have are complete nonsense. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask you about that. Uh, since you since you bring it up, um, Talk to me about that because I was I was as I was reading this I was thinking about um, the other things that we talk about on this podcast uh, like climate change and like the situation with models around you know the COVID nineteen virus uh, so it seems to me that the weather is a complex system and I'm not sure about what about viruses the viruses let's, let's start with viruses let's not take COVID but Ebola. Okay. So Ebola is a is a virus that kills 70% of the infected people and that gets transmitted via the blood or other excrements of the human body. And so it's not very contagious, but if you get it, you 70, have a 70% chance of dying. Yeah. Now, this virus, because of its strong characteristics, can be modeled really well using, using partial differential equations. So there are epidemiologic models that are so good that you can basically model an outbreak somewhere in Africa really well and also model how to contain it. So there are, if if you have, so although the virus and the way it's it's spreading inside a human population is a complex phenomenon of a complex system, there are very strong effects that enable modeling via mathematics that is really adequate. Mm. This didn't work for COVID because COVID has a, a very, very different um, patterns of spreading and is, is uh, has in the most cases is, is, is an asymptomatic disease. Therefore, the same models which work really well for Ebola of rabies can't be used for COVID. Mm. So, so vir the, the pattern with which viruses spread in populations are complex. However, with some viruses, we have very, very good epidemiological models due to the properties of how the virus spreads. Mm. Now with climate, we don't have this. So climate is a complex uh, phenomenon which we don't understand at all. We understand some partial aspects of it. Like with all complex systems, we can make partial models. So we have good partial models also of the human sleep-wake cycle or the female sexual cycle, right? Per yeah. Almost perfect models, yeah. but or very good models, but they are partial. And so for climate, we have partial models like modeling a certain um, wind patterns that that uh, are recurrent, or of course the, the 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 climate, the annual climate change that we have in a certain region of the world of the Earth every every year, every month. So so there are partial climate models, but we don't have convincing or adequate climate models um, that to describe the future of the climate, and that's because we don't understand the causality of the climate and that's because the climate is a complex system so we we must we must see that um we have never been able and i think for structural reasons we'll never be able to model the climate right and so i mean this isn't this isn't the, the this isn't podcast about climate change but it just seems yeah. to be so relevant um what we're told so you know i'm not not a specialist in this at all but what we're told you know by politicians and so on is is what we need to do is we need to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we're emitting and then that will that will bring the temperature of the world down um sounds simplistic but that's because that's that's the message it doesn't sound like it fits with what you're saying does it so i i 
will not make political statements here. I can just speak as a scientist. Yeah. And I would say that that the view that that we have a monocausal system that we can influence like this is very Cartesian and simplistic. Right. In reality, in reality, carbon dioxide is of course a greenhouse gas, but the strongest greenhouse gas that we have is water. Right. And carbon dioxide in the current situation is a minor greenhouse gas, but it is a greenhouse gas. But there are many others. And so um, and also the greenhouse gases are not at all the only reason for, for the climate that we see, um, which hasn't changed very much since, you know, um, it changed quite a bit during the Middle Ages when we had the small ice age. But since the small ice age stopped, it had it hasn't changed much. And and um, if you look at long term climate uh, evolution, uh, the last radical climate change we had was uh, uh, between approximately uh, 14,000 or 15,000 AD and, you know, 7,000 AD mm. um, when there was when the last big ice age ended. So that was the last huge climate change um, phase we had. And since then, we had only minor uh, alterations of the climate. And what we see uh, now is, is like this. Oops, you mean you mean BC? Uh, sorry, yes, <laughs> of course, thank you. BC, before Christ. <laughs> that was that was one of those necessary interventions. Yes, thank you, Barry. Of course, I mean, I mean, BC. And and so and so um, I think that the view that um, the reducing the emission of carbon dioxide will change the climate is scientifically uh, unwarranted. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether this will would happen. We have no idea. Mm -hmm. And there's no way of showing or trying this. There are other very good reasons of 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 wanting to reduce the consumption of carbon of carbohydrates. And that's that it's really stupid to burn them. Because they are great, um, you know, primary material for the chemical synthesis processes we are running. Yeah. And so if we are burning all the nice benz benzene rings, then we can't use them for chemical synthesis anymore. And I've, I've been suffering from this since I was 12 or 13, understood the start, start to understand the, 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 the synthesis pathways that we have in chemistry, how useful this stuff is. So we shouldn't burn it. But for but the main reason is it's too precious to be burned. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Job Jobs. I, I promise I won't ask any more questions about climate change now. Um, one, <laughs> yeah. one, one more, one more question about complex systems. Um, could you theoretically could you map a complex system if you were, if you were, um, several orders more intelligent and knowledgeable than human beings are? Could you theoretically map them? And if you if you couldn't theoretically map them, then how can you account for? what must be a sort of completely, in some sense, random system. So so there's a very important difference between causality and the description of causality. So the, in the book, which, which has no theological content at all, we describe a purely materialistic worldview. Yeah. And in, in, in such a purely materialistic worldview, like the one of modern physics, of course, everything that happens in the world has causal factors. So everything is caused by the four basic interactions, the weak force, the strong force, the electromagnetic force and gravitation. And, and these forces act on the particles that make our world, make up our world, and that, that they cause everything. The point of complex systems is not that complex system theory negates causation. It just says that in many, many situations, we can't describe how the causation works. Right. So I totally believe in a causal universe. But just I also know that with the mathematical capabilities we have, we can only model a bit of it. Now, what would be possible if we had, let's say, um, 100 times better mathematical capabilities? Well, we could model a bit more. Why only a bit? Because the complexity of the real world is still so extremely high that even if our modeling abilities would be 100 times better, so we could, we could for example, analytically solve partial differential equations with hundreds of variables which today we can have four or five variables and we would could do hundreds, then still it would be totally insufficient. Look, the human brain has a hundred billion cells in which um, millions of times more molecules interact. Mm. And so, so therefore we have many, many more variables than even if we would have hundred times better mathematical capabilities, we still couldn't model it. So I think the human brain works in a causal fashion. There are causal effects. It's governed by causal effects. But we can't model them, even if we would, you know, have extraterrestrial super intelligence, because because of the complexity of real nature, the, even such a super intelligence wouldn't be sufficient to model um, the complex systems we are dealing with here. Yes, 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 yes that's very clear. Um, and I, I'd like to talk about theological anthropology in a minute, but let's just let's just make sure we absolutely nail this for our for our listeners. So so you're saying that uh, the human brain is a complex system. 
It would need to be modeled in order to create an artificial general intelligence, which is an artificial intelligence equal to or above human intelligence. And since that's impossible, you can never have an artificial general intelligence. That's 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 the that's the argument. So the 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 human brain is it's it's a complex system, which means it's so complex that even if we were a hundred or a thousand times more intellectually capable than we are we just we would be nowhere near we would be you know we would be a million miles away from being being able to do it and so it is it is essentially theoretically or let's say mathematically impossible yes i mean if you believe that that, that the mathematical capabilities of human beings are essentially limited yeah if you believe that they will develop forever and become ever infinitely better then, of course, that would not be true. But I think this is naive because obviously mathematics is limited and every serious physicist, every mathematician who really knows his work knows about these limitations very, very well. Yes. So and they've all written about it. Einstein, Newton, Planck, um, uh, all the great mathematicians, Hamilton, they've all written about the limitations. Feynman, they know it perfectly. Feynman gives a great example when he discusses a condenser, which is, you know, a for electric circuitry in chapter nine of volume two of his great lectures in physics. He gives the, the cloud as a counterexample, which has right. some properties of a condenser, but which we don't understand how, um, how a, a storm is forming. Yeah. And and how the how the lightnings are really caused caused we have very very crude understanding only and he he highlights this so so everybody who is professionally working as a mathematician or physicist knows about this imitation and would always you know there's this joke um, I think Heisenberg told it that if he visits God and we quote it in the book if he if he comes to or he meets God after dying he would ask him two questions. Um, what's the, the the core reason for relativity, and um, how does turbulence work? And then he thinks he thinks God would have an answer to the first problem, but not the second. <laughs> and so and so this shows you that the the real guys are really humble, you know. Yeah. yeah. Who who then believes in artificial intelligence? Engineers who don't understand the mathematics behind what they're doing. Yeah. These yeah. are the like Ray Kurzweil. They believe it because or Elon Musk. He's also a bachelor in engineering. They they have just you know enough understanding of technology to overestimate what they what can be done but they don't have enough understanding to understand how limited it is yes 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 that no, that that does make sense so all right let's talk let's talk to our listeners then who are concerned about um you know uh a, an agi taking over the world say or um human beings um creating you know, uh, enhanced human beings and um, having some kind of global army that can take over the world or, um, you know, people who are concerned about some kind of globalist government using technology in order to create, you know, a sort of, um, I know these are different things, but these are all concerns, you know, in order to create um, a situation whereby everybody on earth is kind of tracked and and has a digital ID and, and controlled. How, how feasible are these ideas so i mean let's start with the last one so already in the 70s when the trilateral commission was founded um uh, western elites uh, discovered that the digital age could be used to of course have a much better bureaucratic control over the population yeah. right i mean so so in the 11th century in europe bureaucracy was introduced slowly and um, uh, by the ottonians yeah, it wasn't the Ottonians who did this. They started to 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 register people in in towns so that they could levy taxes and so on. And so this has been a thousand ongoing for a thousand years now in Europe, also in England. Um, uh, and um, uh, and it's it is a process where whereby everything gets administered in a more fine grained way. Um, and and so this this of course digital computers and everything around digitization can can make this even you know more all encompassing and, and profound and so this this is certainly a trend that that is ongoing but that has nothing to do with artificial artificial intelligence mm -hmm. so if you if you think of of how power is increased power over people is increased by technology that's mostly no it's just digitization so normally normal use of the computer forcing people to use computers to register by computers to carry computers these these uh, these these types of computers in in their pockets yeah. and, and so on so th this is of course a tremendous way of increasing power but it doesn't have much to do with ai ai can do quite little 
I, I can do face recognition, it can do personal identification, um, it can do a very crude form of filtering of language, but because AI doesn't understand language, it's very easy to speak in a way so that the AI won't understand anymore what you're trying to say. So basically, it's it is, you know, the the the, the means of power don't come from usage of AI, they come from the from digitization. Yeah. All the rest you were asking. So cyborgs, armies of clones, and all of this is just science fiction. It is for, for reasons that we detail on chapter 12 of the book, just technically, technically not feasible. So, so let me give you, do you want to hear the two biggest reasons why that's the case? Go on, come. So let's start with cyborgs. So if you want to do a cyborg, so improve, that means improve a human being by adding technology to the human being into his body, then you need to connect the technology to the, to the central nervous system. Now, the problem with our central nervous system is that, um, the, the, the way that the, our organs, the central organs are connected to the central nervous system makes, um, makes them hardwired from from the from the moment on the light comes to the retina until the final processing of the signal somewhere here in the here and then here in the brain um everything is hardwired so it's an evolutionary adaptation which you can't change so mm -hmm. even if you would you know change the retina by adding some technology you would still have to use the neurons that are linked to the retina and mm -hmm. to use the same circuitry so it you can't change this te technologically because it is really um, a very very complicated biological system that is that is hardwired and hard coded um, genetically yeah. and so so what you can do is for example create tools that enhance uh, our our senses like you can could create um, glasses that let you see radioactivity but what would they do they would just translate the radioactivity maybe into a red view of the surroundings that gets more red when there's more radioactivity but they would still be using the the, the genetically encoded um, neural circuitry of the brain yeah. so this so cyborgization uh, is is just technically technically not possible because we can't change the way that our neurons are wired mm -hmm. um and and the other aspect genetically uh, changing human beings is very simple why this is not possible because even very simple properties like body height is is encoded via more than 80,000 genetic load sign. So that means that basically there are so many parts of the genome participating or contributing in the in the um you know in the phenotype of of even basic properties, we don't understand how at all how this works. If you wanted to change it, like creating even more intelligent or more obedient humans, you would have to understand how the genome encodes these properties. We don't have the slightest idea of this. Yeah. We have and we will never. We have an idea of how rare Mendelian diseases are caused because they are only caused by one genetic locus. And so yeah. we can actually think of, you know, curing those. Yeah. by genetic interventions now do we want to do that that's another question but that's that that's at least you know conceivable techn technologically but but influencing properties of the of the human mind that are encoded by uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of genetic load size just believing that this possible is just shows lack of qualification lack of knowledge yeah and so uh jobs the other day on twitter i saw um a video that came from the world economic forum and klaus schwab was sitting on the stage with somebody and he was talking about the way in the future his mind would be able to be connected to the internet and he would be able to know what people are feeling through through this you know digital connection with them or, or whatever um it sounds like nonsense to me and from what you're saying, I would I would think the pretty clear implication of it is, is that it is nonsense. Is is that is that your take on these kind of things yeah, where so, people are pontificating in this way? Yeah. So Klaus Schwab's book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, that we also cite in our book, is a collection of utter nonsense. <laughs> so it, it contains only really nonsense. This man has never read a textbook of biology, neuroscience or medicine or physics. Really. Yeah. He has no idea. So he he's confabulating about robots nanorobots that will cut out cancer cells from our body i mean he and he doesn't even you know look at very basic stuff for example that such a robot would not be able to move in the intracell intracellular space inter intercellular space yeah. so because the scallop theorem so in the book we explain basic physics basic theorems from physics that 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 prove that he's absolutely wrong mm. and it's just it's just that um 
in in software engineering they say read sorry read the effing manual right mm -hmm. you yeah. just should read the effing books basic textbooks you know it's just he's just lacking it's it's insane that he has no clue of the most basic things and and is confabulating like a madman really i don't understand why how he can get away with it i yeah. the only reason is i think it wouldn't have been possible a generation ago i think the reason is that nowadays so many journalists also lack education yeah Yeah. And so that the quality of the education system has gone down. And now we have so many journalists who are so poorly educated that that's why they spread this uncritically because they are intellectually incapable of understanding what a nonsense this is. But it's really utter nonsense. Yes. Yes. So uh, in some ways, I think that's quite that should be quite comforting to people, because I know there are lots of people who listen to this podcast who, are, who have heard about those sorts of ideas that that Klaus Schwab puts about, you know, in the fourth industrial revolution and and through his uh, various um, public pronouncements. And they sound in many ways quite scary because it sounds like, you know, this this technology will be utilized in order to control people, in order to track people, in order to enhance people and do all kinds of crazy things that normal people probably don't find very attractive or compelling so, as an idea. So, I mean, he reminds me of Dostoevsky's great inquisitor in the Brothers mm -hmm. Karamazov. Mm. Right. The first time I listened to your podcast was when you talked about the brother, brothers Karamazov. Mm. With whom was this? I don't remember, but it was a great podcast. Thank you. And you remember it? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Of yeah. course, yeah. I love. And, I love and so that. the great inquisitor is also arguing that you should control people by fear, and I think that's what's going on. You think that's that's what's going on? That's the motive. I don't know whether he himself be so. If he is as good as the great inquisitor, he, he himself doesn't believe in it. But maybe he's not. Maybe he believes it himself. Who knows? I can't judge this, and I won't. Yeah, I mean, I think the the what I was talking about probably was about the way the grand inquisitor talks. You know, he his critique of Christ is that Christ wants to give people the freedom to choose. But freedom brings about anxiety. And so what the Grand Inquisitor is going to do out of the benevolence of his heart is he's going to take away their choice and and control them. And um, it does it does seem to me that a lot of this kind of technocratic impulse operates along the same lines. You know, people are too stupid to be given a choice and they, it makes them anxious anyway. So we better sort of take control. Yeah. And, and, and and of course, technology plays a massive, massive part in that as but, well. But Another aspect is important as well. So in the medieval scare stories, which Luther also criticized, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they were completely irrational as well. They were even from the totally from the perspective of medieval thought, they were, I mean, they were, of course, wrong. And the theoretical, the good people knew that they were wrong, but they were still told for this purpose. Now, I think the whole stories around the fourth industrial revolution are told from a similar motivation and they are scientifically complete nonsense. And it is, yeah, and th they are told for a different reason, not because they have any relation to the scientific reality. Mm, that's interesting. So let's let's come back to let's come back to the argument of the book because one of the things I found surprising about about the book, not not in a bad way, just because I don't really know very much about this, is this is this analogy that that needs to be drawn between machines and human beings in order to even sort of conceptually understand what an AI or an AGI could actually be. It's, it seems like the book is a book as much about anthropology in that sense as it is about machines. So um, I guess I guess one of my questions is, um, well, in order to believe in an AGI, so an artificial general intelligence, you have to have a you have to have a basically deterministic view of a, of a human person, don't you? Because I think you do anyway, because machines are however they're created, they are essentially algorithms, aren't they? So you have inputs and you have outputs. And those inputs may be very, very complex, um, but nevertheless, they're still inputs. They can't, there's no will in a machine. A, a machine can't can't will something unless it's been programmed to do that. Now, somebody who, who had, uh, who believes in free will, or, you know, however you want to understand that, um, understand that i think in in philosophical terms it would somebody like that would be called a compatibilist um and somebody who doesn't believe in free will of, of some sort would be called a determinist if you are a compatibilist in that sense you could never have an artificial general intelligence that's equal to a human being because there's no way a, a, a machine can have a will which which a compatibilist believes that a human being does like we're not pre-programmed to do everything that we do we're not physically determined but there is some element within a human being which actually in some sense chooses and uh, am i right am i right in thinking along these lines well we managed in the book to actually argue against the possibility of agi without 
speaking explicitly about the idea of a free will. Right. So we we dodge the question, and that has very good philosophical reasons because I don't, Barry and I have slightly different reasons. Barry could comment on this, but my reason is that I think that the question whether there is a free will or not is philosophically not answerable. Right. And Kant shows this really elegantly in the critique of the pure reason in the um, uh, antinomian lehre. So that's a passage where he shows this, I think, very convincingly. So therefore, I don't want to base an argument, a uh, scientific argument, on a question that can't be answered. Mm. And uh, but but it is certainly so that even if ultimately the entire will we have is somehow determined in a way we don't understand, <laughs> even to emulate the will in the will that in which we the will in the way we subjectively. Um, uh, uh, experience it, we would need to model it mathematically. Mm. And because we can't do that, we can't emulate the will in a machine. So even if the will is not free, but our our experience of our own will is an illusion, that could be the case, philosophically speaking, even then we can't create a machine with a will. Mm. And this is, I think, the good thing that we don't even need to assume the free will in order to, to say we can't create a machine with a will. Mm -hmm. But but if if we if we are allowed to use theological arguments in addition, then it becomes even much simpler to argue against um, against the machine having a will. But of course, positivists won't accept theological arguments, right? Yeah. And so and so, Barry and I were writing a scientific book, so we we use only arguments from that that are acceptable in a scientific context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Barry, do you have anything to add to that? There's no pressure to contribute. Uh, actually. I, I do. I, I don't think that we say enough about the will in the book. I agree with Jobst about the, uh, the the open question whether the will is free, a question which will probably never be settleable. Hmm. Uh, but I'd like to hear Jobst say a little bit more about why we can't model the will. And um, I, that I sent him this morning a, a, a press release that that uh, AI engineers had finally uh, defeated the game of diplomacy. And the game of diplomacy involves the exercise of will, uh, including the creation of coalitions with other players and so forth. And now AI can beat human beings playing diplomacy. So maybe he can comment on that. So the game of diplomacy, it, it, I read it, the thanks for sending this, Barry. So it can, it is now the AI is now among the 10 top 10% 10 best players. And so this this is quite remarkable. Why is this feasible? Although the machine doesn't have a will, it works like this in diplomacy. I've played it quite a lot when I was, you know, a teenager. In diplomacy, um, you you um, you ultimately obtain points for what you do. And so whenever you have a, a closed world situation where you can model the behavior and the incentive for the behavior just with this point based system, and also the 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 dimensions of the space in which the game is evolving doesn't, doesn't change um, and it is also fairly limited. And that's the case in diplomacy. Then you can emulate such a game with new neural networks and uh, reinforcement learning. And that's what they did. And it's, an, it's a very impressive, you know, result of modern engineering. So I'm not saying that this is simple or not really remarkable. But it has nothing to do with the free will because because you can just by having billions and billions of runs through games, the machine can learn how to optimize to obtain the maximum number of points. Mm -hmm. And if whenever that's the case, whenever such a simple utilitaristic framework can be applied, again in a in a situation with limited variables, limited dimensions, and unchanging elements and unchanging element relationships, which all of them need to be constant, then you then you have not a complex system anymore, but then you have kind of a, a simpler system. And, and this together with the possibility of rewarding the machine, um, which is the, allows you then to, to calculate an optimization algorithm called reinforcement learning. And that's, that's how this works. And therefore, like in other games, like in the game of Go, for example, the machine can become as good as or better as a human being. Mm. But but that is not an open world situation. In an open world situation where you have changing environments and also no you cannot assign points to an outcome you can't use the reinforcement learning to get the machine to 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 learn the behavior and then you have miserable failures so 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 yes we we don't have a long chapter about about the will in the book but um but overall the problem is that we don't understand how the will works and what we can do is give the machine simple goals like those needed to win the game of go or the game of diplomacy, but we can't um, uh, emulate a will. Mm, yeah, 
Yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about anthropology? I, I do want to I do want to ask some theological questions in a minute, but there's another there's another strong aspect of the book um, that that comes through, which is that you utilize various other areas of anthropology in the book or, or let's say um, fields of study, which in some way describe what a human being is or what human experience is. So, for example, um, phenomenology which you know i think um, broadly speaking is about the way uh, human beings uh, experience the world let's say and their and and how they sort of understand their own experience you know bracketed out from sort of abstract um philosophical concerns you talk about the um ecological school in sci- in um psychology which says that human beings need to take a um they're sort of intrinsically linked to their environment you can't understand a human being without um also understanding the environment that the human being is in. You talk about sociology and social ontology, which again is about the way that human beings need to be understood with relationship to one another. And I think the the thrust that I got from this is that in trying to sort of model what a human being actually is, all of these complex factors make it that much more difficult to even conceive of how a machine could even, even theoretically be able to encompass all of this uh, am i am i am i understanding that broadly speaking correctly yes so basically we have we we are using the phenomenologist uh Scheler, max Scheler, and his pupil arnold gehlen who was a who was one of the fathers of the school of philosophical anthropology we use them you use them quite a lot to explain in the in the early chapters of the book our view of of human beings mm-hmm. and um basically um it's it is it is uh, we use this to define intelligence this this school of thought but also to define um what what are the fundamental drivers of 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 the human way of being and um on one side the 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 human being is is always a social entity can't you know grow can't become an adult without social interactions and also needs social interactions all of his life but even if you look at this you know um, Western fiction of the human as a pure individual, which mm. which is a big theme since you know classical Greece is a, a big theme in our culture. Even then, the system is very complex. But when it interacts with other complex systems, you get a, a, a system of complex systems, and um, it, it 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 enables um, uh, novelty all the time. Mm. And um, I think that this this you know tension between seeing human being as individuals, um, which which thanks to their you know um, to 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 their rationality and their autonomy and their and their subjective freedom of choice in combination with uh, with their social character this has created the incredible dynamics of western mm. civilization and the evolution of western civilization mm. and that's that's how western civilization came to change the world entirely and and um this just illustrates the incredible complexity of this system that 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 our species basically forms yes yes and another thing you, you talk about, um, we really must get to theology in a moment, but another thing you talk about, which I think is really, really interesting, is the way you talk about there's a lack of models concerning neuroscience, um, and particularly when it comes to deficiencies in brain function that give rise to things like autism and schizophrenia. Um, it, the, as far as my reading of that bit was, was that you were basically saying that we just don't have, you know, if science is supposed to be able to, if science... Let me put that differently. Science is about the ability to describe, explain and predict things. And the brain just can't be explained or predicted, particularly in these areas where there's there appears to be something wrong with the brain. But but we, we don't really know what it is. Yes. I mean, even if you take, quote unquote, purposely simpler diseases like Alzheimer's disease, which is a only a neurodegenerative disease where, where basically cells die or parkinson right cells in the in a certain circumscribed area of the brain start to die and so even these diseases we don't have adequate disease models for but schizophrenia or chronic depression deep personality disorders we have no idea how they arise yeah and i think we we have to um live with this yes. we can you know try to understand them better but we have an essential limitation of of uh, of explaining them and also treating them, and we have to accept this. The same is true for many types of cancer. So I believe that these these dreams that modern medicine can um, can uh, you know win the war on cancer or or you know find a cure for Alzheimer or a cure for schizophrenia, 
I think these are dreams that that have arisen because of the early success of Cartesian medicine. Mm. So the invention of insulin or, you know, painkillers, uh, synthetic morphines, um, synthetic hormones. So there were there was a lot of incredible progress between 1920 or even 1900 and 1980 in medicine. Mm. And people have then naively extrapolated because that was the time when the monocausal aspects the, or oligocausal aspects of the human body were exploited technologically. Mm. And there are some that you can exploit really well. Yeah. And and um, then people have extrapolated from this that this is also, that there is a linear continuation of this progress and they fail to see um, that uh, that once uh, certain fruit have been harvested, it becomes systematically more and more difficult, and that mu- less and less progress is is, um, uh, is is to be expected in the future in in medicine. And it's we have to live with this, and I yeah. think we can. So, Joe, you're, you said, uh, did you describe it as Cartesian medicine? Is that what you said? Yes. So, I'm assuming that's to do with Descartes. Um, a, a, dualistic view of the, the human being can you is it or, or am I wrong it has that? more to do with his uh simple mechanical view of causation right so, right. so for Descartes um you can basically mathematically describe everything that's going on in a human body it's a French tradition later on uh, Laplace also was, or La Métrie whom we quote in the book were also in this tradition they believed that you can with relatively simple laws explain everything that's going on in the human body and then change it at will Okay. That's also what what is then in Lecon in, in Auguste Comte's um, uh, positivism, and of which you also find remnants in neo positivism and today's postmodern positivism. This 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 Cartesian idea that that in the end we can influence things at will because everything is has a mechanical explanation, and that's of course total nonsense. I mean, there, everything is caused by something, but it's not simple, right? Yeah. And so and so the, the idea that the, the med- medical progress is just in finite infinite it because because you can just use this cartesian explanation for everything that just shows a lack of understanding of the complexity of of these organisms of the organisms yeah. Yeah, yeah i'm with you i'm with you so there's 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 sort of at least two areas there isn't there there's there's the there's the question of what the mind actually is with relationship to the body and in the book you want to strongly argue against a kind of cartesian dualism yes. which separates the mind and the body and says that the you know the the body is essentially just like a machine and the the mind is you know it's like a you know, it's like a homunculus a sort of spiritual homunculus a little man spiritual man in the body kind of um in some way interacting with it so you want to move away from that and you want to say that the body and the mind are on you know they're in some kind of continuum with each other so i'd like i'd like to hear more about that but then i'd like to ask specifically jobs as a christian where notions of the soul and the spiritual interact with that picture of the human being. So so let me quickly answer the first question. So in the book, we expose a very, uh, in a way, classical monism, materialistic monism, which says all processes, our body is made of matter. All processes in the body are interactions of particles of matter governed by the four laws of interaction that physics des- physics describe and and so th- this is the to simplify the theory of the book this is super anti you know spiritual there's no soul in this argument it's a purely scientific view this is my view as a scientist now as a private person i'm a christian so i have a very different view so i think as a as a christian and as a private person and maybe i would also write a book about it but then it wouldn't be a scientific book um, uh, in the sense that this book is a scientific book, um, uh, I believe that we are created by God, mm. and I think that 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 creation uh, is is in a way we can't understand it fully, but we we have to accept as part of our faith that we are created with a mind body continuum and a soul. Mm. And then I'm indeed a dualist that I believe that the soul and the mind body, con- there's a soul on one hand and the mind body continuum on the other hand. And Shela also proposes dualism because he was as a philosopher all the time mixing, you know, scientific views with theological views, which I don't do. But personally, I believe that also in this dualism that Shela describes between the soul on the one hand and the mind body continuum on the other hand, and that, that, that therefore also the soul is eternal. Yeah, because it is separate from the mind body continuum and is basically, as the Bible says, added to the body. Right. right? Yes, I, I see what you're saying. So, but with the 
the properties of the soul must include things like willing, understanding, and things which you would normally associate with the mind, right? Ah, so that's very interesting. So so the I think the two greatest thinkers who have thought about the person, these are Dan Scotus and before him Boetius. Mm. So and they they don't write so much where the capabilities of the person are located. So so they just they just they just assume that God, we are created by God and now we exist. And then they ask what makes us be human. And then it's autonomy, intelligence, um, uh, independence, um, uh, what else is Boetius saying? Um, uh, individuality, mm. um, self-consciousness, um, responsibility, and sociality, right? Mm. So these are the, these, these are, this is what Boetius basically lists as properties of, of, uh, of the human person. But I don't think that he's trying too much to attribute this to a certain part. Um, so and I'm also not inclined to do this so much. I rather I think it's it's better to to leave this question open and and I think that the the, the, the scripture doesn't force us to locate the property somewhere. We can just assume that where they were we were created like this to have them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. It just it just seems to me that in that in that particular picture that you you just gave, I mean, when you were gesticulating, you were you were literally saying, you know, on the one hand we have the mind body continuum and then on the other hand you have the soul. It seems to me that the soul and at least the mind need to have some kind of continuity with each other in order for yes. it to make ten, make sense that you know, the soul say survives death, but that must mean in some sense that the person the person that we really are survives death, you know, with our with our will, with our with our love, with our thoughts and memories, and and so on. Well, it's it's very hard to say. I'm and I'm not a specialist for this. I'm not a theologian. Um, so I I believe in the in the in eternal life that 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 the soul is so to speak the bearer of the eternal life. Yeah. But in which form this is actually happening, I think is speculation. And I'm 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 re I don't like speculation that much. Yeah. So. yeah. So I, I'm not going to that level of detail. I can what see. is important to mention is that Dan Scotus, he was the first to highlight that that sociality is so important. So he says, quam vis in re non sit persona nisi quer est ad alterum. So that means we have to be aware that there is no sub substant substance of the person without um, uh, being with others. And I think this is super, uh, super insight. He was mm. a re he's one of the total geniuses of the late medieval um, theology and philosophy. And he put and I think we can't go beyond this. This is really it, you know. And modern sociology has has basically re 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 rewritten this in new language, but they repeat what he says. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 basically we can't live without the other. And he says this in a very beautiful way. Yes. Because he says that um, there's no substance of the person without the other and I, I just want to mention this because many many listeners may not know it where it comes from and i think it's so beautiful yes yes it is indeed indeed it is um okay so I'm, I'm with you there and i won't i won't push you any further on that in particular but i'm interested to hear your view about things like demonic possession in the gospels it just it, it rose to me when i was reading the bit about brain function about schizophrenia and things like that do you have any do you have any thoughts about that i know that would have to be in the sort of private person category but yeah. presumably with things like schizophrenia and things like that as a sort of scientist one would want to say that this is to do with some kind of um malfunction in in the in the physical brain but then of course the gospels they they depict people as being actually demonically possessed and oh. you know out they they, they, they don't they've lot they don't they're not in their right mind and so on i can't really can't really remember the exact sort of words they use in the gospels but words to that effect you know he's out of his mind and things like that do you have any thoughts about that yes a very strong opinion so i believe that schizophrenia is about a chemical process and that possession is something else right okay so, so so schizophrenia if you look at typically schizophrenic they have biochemical defects in their neurons mm. which create a schizophrenia and even if they believe i've i've i as a young psychiatrist i've seen, i treated a, a, a female woman who thought that she was possessed by the devil she heard him speak inside herself these were just you know broken neurons basically so she wasn't possessed i don't believe in it at all however i believe that there's evil mm. and now what is evil what is possession by evil so so Bultmann, I think the, one of the greatest theologians together with St. Paul and Luther, says mm. that evil is 
happens that sinning open sinning which is a basic condition of our existence opens the door for evil but then once you commit real evil you get into a cycle of sinning mm. so that your sinning intensifies intensifies be, be uh, beyond the normal level right mm. so we are all sinners otherwise we would not need grace we wouldn't need god and we wouldn't need christ but but basically when you are evil and you are so to speak what is called possessed in in more you know archaic language then you are in a cycle of intense sinning mm. and actually of forget not only forgetting god but you know um uh, escaping from god ridiculing god negating god um uh, and 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 uh, and this is i think evil so possession what it was called possession in evil times or uh, or in the times when the gospels were written i think is just indulging in sin right really okay. and so and so this is and so there are people like this yeah. Um, uh, and it's my, it's not my job to list them and to, you know, to judge them. That, 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 that's what Matthew 5 tells us not to do. But basically, there are such people and they are really, um, uh, they are really in this, you know, they feel comfortable with sinning. Yeah. And that's evil. Yeah. So in the Gospels, then, when sort of Christ casts a demon out of somebody, you would see that. How would you, you know, how would you see, ah. for example, the de the demon uh, legion that is is cast ah, cool. out and and transferred to the to the herd of pigs? Yeah. So basically, this is this is this for me. This story means that God, in the in the in the person of of His Son, in in in, in His own Son, which is God at the same time, has the ability to free us from evil, even mm. from, from evil of the worst and most terrible kind. I mean, the way the demon talks in Marcus. Mm. This is this is one of the best passages in the whole gospel. It's he says we are legion and we are many. Mm. He says yeah. about himself the demon. So he he speaks in in, in plural and it's a, it's a very moving passage. And and uh, when when Jesus uh, so to speak casts him out, that means that Jesus has the power. God has the power to free us from evil, to free us from the cycle of sin, even in its deepest and most terrible and terrifying form. That's what this story tells us. And I believe that this is true. Mm. And this is why what Dutta says when he talks about the freedom of a Christian, we obtain this freedom, and you mentioned it as well, because God frees us from from sinning, but even not only from sinning, which we all do every day, because sinning is just forgetting about God. It happens to each of us every day, but but from from the from the so to speak worst form of sinning, which is so to speak sinning in open and self, uh, you know, self indulgent denying denying of God, yeah. and and this is and and so these stories um, from from the from the gospel tell us that 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 God can even overcome this. And this is what makes these stories so powerful and why they are at the core of our faith. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. Speaking I hope about, that's... No, no, no. I mean, I, I hear, I hear. It's, in, it's very interesting. It's not something I thought about that much. So I'm just, I'm just yeah. listening. I'm not, I'm not evaluating. I uh, just yeah. listening and, and thinking about it. Oh, well, I am evaluating, but you know, in, a, in an inchoate <laughs> yeah. way. Um, but let me, let me ask you something else. I mean, this, this, this conversation, it raises so many, it raises so many, important things now it seems to me like you're saying that human beings are you know we're incredibly complex and from a kind of theological perspective you would want to say that this is a reflection of you know the wisdom the manifold wisdom of god in in creating not just human beings but you know the the, the world the universe and, and creatures and 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 so on and so forth that, that really we need to have a sort of humility before before all of this but then at the same time it's almost as if we're saying that it. I don't want to say in principle, but but if everything is if everything is subjected to to the law of causality, that it could in theory be or in principle be explained. And I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, I, I suppose the question I have is: Are there things about human beings that science simply can't can't explain? Things like, for example, feelings. So, are feelings are they are they chemical processes? Are they something to do with your soul or your spirit? Could it be, so, could it be so both? Now comes a very important. This is, I think, the most important point of our discussion. So I believe I've struggled with this all my life. How can I be a Christian who believes in the miracle of salvation and the, and the crucifixion, resurrection? I believe in all of this. And at the same time, I believe that the world is made of matter and governed by the four basic interactions that physics describes. Yeah. And I think it's the only way to do this is to, to accept that there are, that there are three different kinds of knowledge. Mm -hmm. The first kind of knowledge is the positive knowledge we have of the empirical world. For the positivists, it's the only knowledge with that we can have. 
Then the second level of knowledge is the build. Oh, I need to switch this off. It's is Bildungswissen, which is the knowledge about culture and and uh, and also social norms, cultural norms, uh, which comes from from reading books, from looking at works of art, and so on, and and um, to which also belongs philosophy. And the third part kind of knowledge is the theological knowledge, the knowledge of salvation. And I just live with the fact that I cannot that the first two types of knowledge I can you know combine them. Yes. So when I do philosophy, the book basically that Barry and I wrote combines the first two types of knowledge, uh, of knowledge. But the third knowledge I can't really combine it with the others, and I have to live with the fact that this is so, and I don't mind. Right. So I think the medieval, if you read Thomas, the attempt to bring all these types of knowledge into one system that is free of contradictions, that's impossible, and we have to accept this and live with it, and that's what Rudolf Bultmann calls um, the decision to believe. To yeah. be faithful. So, of course, faith needs to come from inside of you, which is a revelation. But you can also accept that that it's incompatible with the scientific view of the world and just say it doesn't matter right. and accept this. And that's yeah. what I do. Okay. But but that might work for the individual. But what if you were talking to somebody who was an atheist who said, you know, the world is matter and I've got no need to posit some kind of extra explanatory phenomenon. So why should I believe in a soul or anything spiritual. Um, so, so it so basically, um, if this is a question, why should I be faithful, right? And um, I, I mean, the the answer given by by by, um, and that's the only theology I really know by Protestant theology is that there is the revelation, which which reveals the presence of God to us, mm. and um, we we are we are asked to listen to this re revelation. Um, this is this is one strong argument. The second argument is that, for me at least, um, I could not make sense out of my life if I was personally a total materialist. If right? you were I would, sorry, I didn't quite hear that. If you were personally what? If I I could not personally make sense of my life if, if I would be an atheist because I couldn't understand the suffering and and the difficulties of living in this world. I couldn't. Um, I would wouldn't be able to make sense of of my life in this world without believing in God, and also I would feel um, overwhelmed with the responsibility I have and and my in and especially with my own insufficiency and my own defects, which is what Luther called sin, yeah. right? And I couldn't de I couldn't cope with it. Now the materialist may say, well, then you are a wimp, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so, but, but I don't care. I mean, this is how I see it, and I don't think I don't see a necessity in convincing an atheist. If if a person chooses to be an atheist, he can, he should. I can only quote. I think it's Psalm thirteen or fourteen, which talks about the non-faithful and says, you know, it's their problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I, I I suppose the thing is, and this is it's so interesting to think about this. Um, the thing is, is when when. When I think about the human person, I'm resistant to the idea that the language of physical causation could be could be um, exhaustive. So I so I would want I, I and as I say, I haven't really thought this through fully, um, but but I would want to say that things like certain types of emotion or certain types of spiritual experience or spiritual feelings or whatever you want to say. Um, that they couldn't, in principle, be described using language pertaining to the laws of physics. That there's something about that which is esoteric and and ultimately is, eludes eludes that language. I don't know so, what do you think. So I think that that our inner experience of our emotions can't be described at all using physics. Okay, but would not there not be all. some people? Would there not be some people who would want to say, "Well, those are just chemical reactions." Yeah, and even if we don't really understand them, that we will, in principle, one day. So that's what we say in the book, and that's my view of the world as a scientist. Right. But as I said before, at the same time, I have also participated in knowledge of salvation, as 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 Sheila calls it, and in in this part of my existence i i believe that the, the explanations of physics are insufficient yeah. so and i have to live with the fact that i cannot bring these two worlds together in myself and i think that this is also what what is called the challenge of faith 
yeah. yeah is, is is that you have to accept that you can't understand every aspect of it and can't make it contradiction free like Spinoza and Thomas of Aquinas wanted. They wanted to make faith completely rational, contradiction free. They wanted to have a perfect dogmatic edifice. You won't get it. Right. And mm. that's that's what the Bible says. All the Psalm says it. the Jewish tradition says it, but also the, the, the New Testament. You can see it everywhere that we have, have accept. We have to accept our limitations and also that there's a, a certain, you know, um, that's why it's faith and not rationality. Mm. Yeah, this is um, <laughs> this is really, really interesting. And I, I think I think you will have to pick this up again and do this, do do another and second time. <laughs> Do another episode and and follow these themes through and i need to think about it more as well but um we're, we're running out of time for this session so i what i want to do is i just want to open up and say uh jobs or, or barry do you have any just anything that we haven't talked about which you would like to you'd like to get in at this at this late stage in the conversation barry, you go first i have one point but barry yeah, so i think that the conversation we just had or you just had in the last few minutes leaves uh a feature of the book uh, untouched. So in the book, we talk about the brain as a physical object made of physical particles, which are governed by physical laws. But we also say that we can know very little about the way those laws work, because we, we have no way of gaining the necessary information about the uh, behavior of uh, the particles in the brain. But also, it's a complex system. And so we can't use physics in order to make predictions about how the brain works. Mm. I would also like to mention that uh, Jobs just gave a 16 hour long lecture in Buffalo on quantum physics. No. And I think one of the uh, lessons I learned from that is that physics doesn't really know uh, all that it needs to know about the way physics works. So it yes. seems that we have no clear idea, for instance, about what a particle is. Mm. And that means that what we say in the book, namely that the world is made of particles governed by the four forces, uh, has to be taken with a certain pinch of salt if we're going to take quantum physics seriously. Right. So, so if we take quantum field theory seriously, then we have a big problem of understanding matter mm. in physics, and that that basically shows. I think it's a nice way of ending the conversation. Uh, we can't. I can't go into the detail. We can. This this would be a third episode to to talk about quantum field theory and what it, its philosophical and theological implications are. But but what is certain is that it that that the best mathematics mathematical description of nature we have, which is quantum field theory and general theory of, theory of relativity as well. But let's let's uh, take this aside now. But that that quantum field theory shows us that we under that we don't understand really how matter works. Mm. And so, and so, the the view, the positivist view of of nature is very, very superficial. And the more you learn about about real physics and what the results are that we can derive from it, the more humble you become. Mm. And that that also opens very much more space for faith, mm. yeah, or or for an alternative view of the world, or for a philosophical view of the world that is not only purely materialistic and you know. Um, uh, uh, based on on simple ideas of causation, and so so the idea, the one idea that I wanted to bring across that is that my biggest intention with the book was to show the limits of science, technology, and mathematics, mm -hmm. and and to to really highlight that that we still live in an age where we overestimate totally what we can do with this, and this is with this is very strong it's like the religion of our time to overestimate the reach of technology and science mm -hmm. and i think you the better you know it the more humble you become and the more clear it becomes that many 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 phenomena in our lives can't be explained at all with it mm. well i think that's an excellent place to end um genuinely i want to do another conversation and um and 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 explore this this theme because it raised all sorts of questions to me um but that's that's very very clear and i think that's a that's a that's a fascinating note on which to end so um jobs langrieb and barry smith thank you for coming on uh, to this episode of irreverence and uh, thanks to everyone for listening as well and if you'd like to give us feedback we'd be really interested in that irreverentpod at gmail.com um but Gentlemen, really, really appreciate your time and your your expertise on this. It's been absolutely fascinating and wonderful to hear. So thank you so much. Thanks for inviting us. Thank okay. you, Jamie. Bye-bye, Jamie. Bye now.